each other. Welcome everyone into the room. Let's worship our God together. to them and we'll see you back in one minute. We serve a God who is great, a God who is strong, a God who is mighty, yes. a God of miracles. Hallelujah. Yes. We thank you, Lord, because you are. 
Fuck out. 
Jesus. There's nobody greater than you. There's nobody greater than you. Hallelujah. We praise your name. We praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because you thought that I was worth saving, Lord. You thought I was worth it when you left your throne of glory and came down to earth. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Praise be unto you, Jesus. You thought I was worth saving So you came and changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free so I could be whole, so I could tell everyone I know for saving. So you came, so you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you clean me up inside. So you clean me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed. So you sacrificed your life. So I could be so free. I could be free. So I could be whole. So I could tell everyone I know. You thought I was worth saving. So you came. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you clean me up inside. So you clean me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life. So I could be free. So I could be whole. So I could tell everyone I know. You thought I was worth saving. So you came. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping, so you clean me up inside. So you clean me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life, so I could be free, so I could be whole, so I could tell everyone I know. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Lord, because you've sacrificed your life. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for my freedom, Lord. Thank you for my freedom. Thank you, Lord, because you love me so. And for that, I worship you. Hallelujah. We praise you because you are a great God. You are a great God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The splendor of the King. Hallelujah. Is clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. And darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. How great is God.
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. Not just for what you've done, but for who you are. Yes. You are great. You are mighty. Yes. Lord, we lift our hearts in praise to you, Hallelujah. God. We honor you. You are worthy, Lord. Yes, God. Worthy of all our praise, God. Yes, God. Even in the midst of depression, you are worthy of our praise. Yes. Even in the midst yes. of coronavirus, you are worthy of yes. our praise. Yes, Even when my bills can't be paid, you are worthy of yes. the yes. praise, God. You are a great, mighty healer, provider sustainer God. Yes, God we worship you father you are so worthy I thank you for your presence here God I thank you for your presence that is with each and every one who is watching now God you're so worthy you are worthy you are worthy thank you Jesus may you be honored and praised throughout this whole remaining of the service God Yes, God. May every word be glorifying Jesus. and edifying Hallelujah. to you, yes, pleasing God. to your ears, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for your greatness and your presence. Uh, just as a real quick thing before we move any further, um, uh, no, like there's not a children's link this week. So you're, they all, everybody's hanging out together, good things. It's like a family worship weekend. <laughs> so glad that we are here, glad we're able to uh, be together today. Um, man, man, I love being able to worship God uh, together. And so um, it's a good thing. We are in the last final week of the You Asked For It sermon series. Um, what is it? Season three. You Asked For It season three. And um, it's been a good journey. Uh, we're ending on what I would consider a nerdy note. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, so there was a question it's not really even like a question. It's, it's uh, like a topic, really, that was posed on the Eunice and Family page. Um, and you will get to have some pictures on, on the screen and some words and different things, which is good. Um, and so the, um, it's, the topic was Old Covenant and New Covenant. So um, that, was, that was the topic. I think Lisa is the one who put that one up. And the cool part about that is, that later in the um, later in the in the year we'll be going through a sermon series that talks about Jewish culture um, and Hebrew culture and how you know and the relevance for us in that right now. So um, hang tight. This is kind of like the appetizer to that. Um, it's old covenant and new covenant was the topic. The name of the sermon is raising Adam. Uh, I'll talk to you about that in a second. It'll make sense. Uh, but the name of the sermon is Raising Adam. We'll be in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. I'm going to pray, and then we'll dive in. Father, you are so good. <laughs> I feel like I just am flooded with joy uh, and anticipation of your goodness. Not anticipation of what you'll do, but just an anticipation of your goodness. You are good. God, we affirm your goodness. We affirm it is a reality. It's truth. It's factual. You are good. So we can stay in a place of anticipation of your goodness because good is all you can be. <laughs> good is all you can be is, I mean, it's good. That's all you can be, God. So thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. And even as we dive into this portion of Scripture, God, may our hearts be united with you. May our hearts be united with one another. May we find you as we seek you. And may our lives be transformed by your word. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I said we're ending on a little bit of a nerdy note because there's a lot of back story. Like, there's a lot of back history. When you start talking about Old Covenant and New Covenant stuff, you kind of have to have at least some foundational understanding about even what that means. So I'm going to break that down, but I entitled the sermon Raising Adam um, because of really what Adam means. Uh, many of us think that it's just a name of the first human being to ever be formed out of dust, and it's not. Like Adam is a word. It's a Hebrew word, and it, Adam, and it means human. It means man. It's not just a uh, it's not just a name. It means man, um, as in humanity, not man as in male, man as in humanity. So when we start talking about this idea of Old Covenant and New Covenant and Old Testament and New Testament, a part of how we have to see this has to do with God raising humanity. Uh, and Romans kind of hints at that, and that's actually where we'll be today. But there's another picture I want you to see before we get into that, um, and, it, and it's because we are fans of this show in our home. If you like sci-fi, you like, like superhero movies or TV shows, there's a show on Netflix called Raising Dion. And so this is not like it's not a sermon about Raising Dion. But it can, it, like you watch the story of this single mom who's a she's a widow who is raising this superhero kid on her own 
and all of the chaos and, and all of the challenges that come along with all of this power in a five-year-old, right? Like he's, he's, he's in elementary school. I don't think he's five. I think he's like seven or eight years old. But he has no idea how to use these powers. He's figuring them out. He's teleporting randomly. He's doing different weird things with his hands. He got Legos flying around. And some scenes, he's floating his little uh, Fruit Loops throughout the house. A bag of chips, his mom grabs him and is like, no, you can't have any more chips. But how do you tell a kid with superpowers he can't have chips? Anyway, <laughs> it's a funny, it's a cool, like, family show. Uh, and the reason why I put that up is because raising Dion, uh, the, the challenge of that mother is, is, is unique. And when we talk about the idea of raising Adam or raising humanity, it is also a unique and interesting journey. Um, I like to think of the beginning, the early, uh, the early parts of Scripture where Adam, the human, the, the being, is first created um, as like birth of humanity. That's not difficult for us to understand. The birth of humanity was right there in the garden. But as God's relationship with humanity continues, you see that just as much as for a child, there are more expectations placed upon that child as they grow, and there are more privileges given to that child as they grow. The same thing is happening with Adam, humanity. So I'm, I'm, I want us to separate especially for this conversation, the idea of Adam being one person and really, really hone into the idea of Adam being humanity. God has given humanity more responsibilities as we go and more privileges along with that. Uh, And so we'll talk about that in a moment too. But before we get to this idea of covenant, let's talk a little bit about mission, the mission of God specifically. The mission of God is that creation would know its creator. Like that's That is the whole reason why there are even covenants to begin with has to do with the fact that God wants creation, not just humans, creation to understand who he is. Why do I say that? Because the first responsibility of humanity, the first responsibility of Adam was to represent God in the garden. That's why God gave, Ab- uh, gave Adam the responsibility and the, the, the role of naming all the animals and caring for the garden. Adam and Eve were to exist together in equal authority over creation as a representation of God in the earth. Creator made the earth and made us like him so that we could represent him in the earth. And honestly, that's the first agreement. That's the first covenant. Like the first covenant that we see is in the, is in the Garden of Eden. So let's look at the definition of covenant real quick, and then we'll talk about some biblical covenants. The definition of covenant is an agreement between two or more parties in which both sides fulfill responsibilities based upon a clearly defined relationship. That's a whole lot of words. But the best way that we can actually look at covenant in our context is it's, it's more than just a contract. It's a marriage. It's a marriage. Like when we think of covenant, we need to think of marriage. Yes, there's a contractual part of marriage, but really there is a defined relationship and those responsibilities within that contract are, are, are lived out based upon that relationship, not just because I've got obligations to you. I love you, wife. So I love you, so I will fulfill the responsibilities of a husband. Wife might say, I love you, husband, so I will fulfill the responsibilities of a wife. And no, that's not gender roles. I'm not talking about that. Like, if your household has traditional gender roles, that's awesome. If they're not traditional, that's awesome. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm really talking about the responsibility that we have of pouring out God's unconditional love on our spouse, right? That's ultimately the responsibility between a husband and a wife is making sure that that spouse knows they're covered and you are God's provision for their covering. So that covenant relationship of a a marriage in some ways mirrors the covenant relationship that God has with humanity, which should not be surprising to us because Paul says it in Ephesians, right? A husband and a wife is supposed to mirror what it looks like for for Christ in the church. So, 
Got that. We know what a covenant is. Let's real quick have a nerdy moment. <laughs> Let's look at some biblical covenants between God and humanity. Because when we look at this idea of old and new covenant, oftentimes we fail to really think about the fact that there are all kinds of covenants in the Bible. There are covenants between God and one person. There's covenants between people and, a, and a one person and another person. So when we start having this conversation about old and new covenants, we need to really think about all of the biblical covenants that are between God and humanity. So there's an Edenic covenant, which is in Eden. I, I alluded to that earlier. Like God has created and provides for creation and humanity's responsibility is caring for it. That's a covenant, right? Like when God gave him, gave Adam and Eve those responsibilities, a, a defined relationship was in place and responsibilities were divvied out based upon that relationship. Creator provides, humanity cares. Then there's that Noahic covenant, which many of us skip over, but it's the covenant that God made with Noah. And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, when Noah and all the animals were on the ark and they landed and all of the stuff was done, God made a covenant with Noah. And the covenant was actually very, their responsibility for humanity hadn't changed very much. The responsibility of humanity was to, to, to uh, be fruitful and multiply, fill up the earth, <laughs> God's responsibility hadn't changed, but he also promised something else to them is that I will not flood the earth again. That's like when, so every time we see rainbows, that should remind us of that covenant. But there was also something else that was different in this covenant. It was the first time where we see that they were bonded in blood. What do I mean by that? Bonded in blood, this Noahic covenant was the first time and it, the pattern continued is that the covenant that God makes with humanity is bonded by some sort of sacrifice. And so in that covenant where God, God actually tells Noah, hey, I want you to make a sacrifice. And, and, and that's a part of this covenant. And that bondedness in blood plays out all the way through. The reason it wasn't there in, with Adam and Eve is because sin hadn't existed yet. But because sin exists now, our covenants, our relationship with God is always through this bond of blood. The Abrahamic covenant, some of us are very familiar with that. It's in Genesis, and it like stretches all the way from like 12 all the way through 17. But in 17, you see this, the, the significance of this covenant, and nothing has changed with regard to God's mission that creation would know who he is. Nothing has changed in terms of humanity being representation of God. But, but as Adam is growing, <laughs> as Adam is being raised, more responsibility comes on. This is actually the first time we see that God truly gives some conditions, not to his love, but conditions to this covenant for humanity. I want you to be circumcised. And the expectation is that you are a blessing to the earth. I got you. As long as we're good, as long as you continue to follow me, as long as you continue to have faith, I will provide for you. I've got all the promises of you being able to, ha to, to have all the things that you need, and I'm going to give you children, and I'm going to make sure that the world knows who you are. Your responsibility is to represent me well. The world should be blessed by your very presence because I am with you. Like, that's that covenant. And, the, and if you remember in Genesis 17, there's this long line of animals that are cut in half. It feels, it sounds, like every time I think about this, like it, it seems real gruesome. <laughs> um, but so I don't try to question it. I just read it and then I just move on. <laughs> but this bond of blood is continued. The Mosaic Covenant is when, when most of us think about Old Covenant or Old Testament, we really are talking about the Mosaic Covenant. It's the law of Moses. It's where we see in Exodus these Ten Commandments. And then there are also um, several, uh, 613, addition, like six, 613 laws altogether in this Mosaic Covenant. What's happening? Adam is growing. And I don't mean just getting bigger, maturing, which means that there are more responsibilities placed upon Adam 
But then also there are more privileges that are, that are placed upon Adam too. Why am I saying that? Let's talk about, let's back up and think about what it is to raise children. When our children are infants, they can't do anything by themselves, and there are also very little expectations placed on them. Just keep breathing, baby. <laughs> like, that's all I need you to do. Just keep breathing. Drink this milk. Poop, and we're good, okay? That's all we need from you at that three weeks old. Breathe, eat, and poop. Occasionally sleep. I, but I don't even have that as an expectation. Just like, because <laughs> there is not, there is the baby's not old enough to have any of those expectations. But eventually, you expect that baby, as he, he or she becomes a toddler, to be able to pick up its toys. And the relationship hasn't changed between parent and child. However, the definition is expanded. Now I'm not just caregiver. I'm caregiver and I'm also lawgiver. You don't expect an infant to follow rules, but you do expect a five-year-old to. And when their rules are not followed, there are also consequences for it. That's what we really are looking at at this law. Like when we look at the law, it's not because God had no expectations before. It's because Adam is being raised. Adam has now more expectations and more privileges that come along with it. What are the privileges that come along with it? Some of that is even that power of the spirit to come and act and, and act on behalf of God. That is all up and through this place, especially after we see this law come into place. And the last covenant that we'll talk about, remember I said there are lots of different covenants, is the Christ covenant. When most people think of new covenant, they're thinking about that. I actually want us to change our thinking, though, about, and maybe even change our vocabulary about old and new covenant. And to actually think most relevant covenant. Because sometimes we feel like when there's something that's old, that means it's gone away. And that's not true. (laughs) That's not actually how any of the covenants of God have worked out with humanity. We start off with little responsibilities and little privileges. And we continue to grow. Eden, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Christ, all of those start off with, with less responsibilities, less, uh, less obligations for humanity and end with more. Many of us feel like there was this drop off at the end of like at the Old Testament when Jesus came. It's like, oh, whoo, good. We don't have the same responsibilities. And the honest truth is that is just not true, saints. <laughs> we actually have more responsibility. The expectation is greater on us as believers. Like, well, we don't have 613 laws. No, well, pause. (laughs) Because Christ didn't come to actually get rid of the law. He came to fulfill it and the law be written on our hearts. Not so we are ignorant or we don't care about the law at all. That's honestly a misconception of how we see the law. So that brings us into where we are in Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 3 is a really, really good uh, chapter, especially if you're trying to understand that transition between the law and faith and or grace. We're not going to actually read all of three, but we are going to read the last portion of it. Right here in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Pause. We'll move to the next portion in just a moment. This Christ covenant, still bonded in blood, you want to understand when, when that first, when that idea of the Christ covenant was first uh, spoken of, it's in Luke. It's when Jesus is talking about, uh, they're having the Last Supper, and he said this cup, and he gives them the bread, and then they also have this cup of wine, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every covenant up until that point has had this, blo- this bond of blood, but it has been this bond of blood of animals. And Christ says, All of the expectations of you being a blessing to the world still exist. All the expectations of you representing God the Father on the earth still exist. All of the expectations of you being able to to have authority over the earth still exist. 
And the power that and the power to be able to do that not only do you have in pockets, but also is forthcoming this Holy Spirit. That's the additional on this new co- covenant. But the difference is you no longer are responsible for finding a way and maintaining a relationship with the Father on your own merit. God has created a way for, for a consistent relationship with him minus your own merit. It, not to say that you don't have to do anything that's good anymore, but it is to say that the, rel- the relationship is no longer based upon how good you can be. The, base, the relationship is based now upon how good I am. Do you see, though, that the pattern is that God still hasn't changed? He's still providing for creation the whole time. He's now provided for humanity this way in which to have consistent relationship with him. So before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, there was this law. And this law was placed there to be a guard for us. He says in the next portion of Scripture, let me put it in another way. This is Paul speaking. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. The law was a babysitter. Like, that's, the be- that's almost like the best way to think about this. Like, and it's not to, that doesn't diminish the significance of it. The law, though, was, the law was there to make sure that we, one, understood what was happening, understood what, what the expectations were, but also to keep us until Christ came. What do you mean keep us? Uh, back up. Children being raised by parents. We have rules. You have a time that you can get up. You have time in which you can eat and what you can eat. Do not eat chocolate for breakfast. Not a thing. (laughs) Yes, I know you want pancakes for every meal, but eating all carbs all day is just not a thing. Balanced meals. (laughs) And we have all these other rules. You have times where you can go to bed. You uh, You can't have certain social media yet. Or you can have this. And no, you can't have a phone yet. You don't need a phone yet. But the moment you do have a phone, there's also restrictions on that phone. And I've, and I, I've actually had to have these conversations in our house, like, when will the restrictions be lifted? It has an, it's not about time. It's about maturity. It's about how, how you're able to navigate that. Don't forget that God is raising Adam. There was a guardian in, pl- in place until Adam was mature enough in Christ. Christ was, the, Christ was the graduation, if you will, into humanity's maturity. Why am I saying that? Because even as adults, we are mature, and the rules that were set when we were kids should still follow us. Don't eat chocolate in the, for breakfast. I don't care how grown you are. Have a real breakfast. I know you like carbs. I like carbs. My nickname is Biscuit. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. My dad gave me that nickname when I was a kid, Biscuit, because I love bread. But I can't eat bread and nothing but bread. And that's not even just because Scripture says that a man can't live by bread alone. It's because I will get round. <laughs> okay? I don't. <laughs> and even though I don't have someone who enacts upon me a bedtime, the rules that my parents gave me for why there was a bedtime still apply to me. Why did my parents give me a bedtime? Because I wasn't mature enough to recognize what it was to ha- need rest. And I felt like I was going to be missing something, and that was, more, that was more enticing than being able to have a good night's rest, so they said, go to bed right now. Well, as an adult, I should be mature enough even without a bedtime, to know I need a good night's rest. I should be mature enough to know I've got responsibilities to take care of, so I have a time to get up too. I should be mature enough to understand what I should do with my property, with my furniture, what what I should do with my relationships, and no longer am I bound by the rules of my parents. However, the reason my parents put those rules in place still exists for me. That's why you can't just get rid of the Old Testament. That's why we can't just get rid of the law. 
That's why we can't get rid of the Sabbath. That's why we can't get rid of dietary, ish, dietary laws. Why I'm not saying that we, have to, we can't eat pork. Nope. I don't actually believe that. In Acts, Acts and even Romans, we see where there is this lifting of the law in that space, but the law, the heart of the law still exists. You should care about what you put in your body. <laughs> Period. Period. Like at the end of the day, like I need us to look at it that way because that way we can see what God is doing with humanity. Yes, God said don't eat certain things before, but really I believe wholeheartedly that the heart behind why God's saying don't eat certain things is because as mature humanity, you should care about what you put in your body. Why does the Sabbath exist? Because as mature humanity, you should care about a rhythm of rest where you can engage with me and not feel like you have to work all the time. Why? Because even scientists have proven that we should rest. We should have a rhythm of it. It is good for our minds. Many of us are exhausted, but it's because we did away with the Old Testament and we don't have any day of rest Christ did not come to abolish the law, came to fulfill it and give us power, maturity, to live it in our hearts. That's why Paul also says in Romans that we shouldn't, we shouldn't have arguments about what foods we can and what we can't eat because at the end of the day, that's not really what it's about. At the end of the day, it's about what's going on in your heart, how you're loving the Father and how you're loving others. That's why Jesus even says that at the end of the day, every single, every single thing that's in the law is hung upon the commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything, everything that the Father has set up as a law is hung upon those, that concept. And a mature humanity understands that and lives in it. And that's why Jesus, that's why the Lord said that he was going to write his law on our hearts. So there's this random question. I actually just kind of answered it. But does that mean the law is irrelevant? No. That doesn't mean that the law is irrelevant. Yes, that means that there are some, there are differences. Absolutely. There, some of the law exists because the children of Israel were coming out of Exodus and they needed, how, they needed to know how to be a people. Wash your hands before you eat. <laughs> that was one of the laws. It, like it, literally, it's wash your hands before you eat. That's a law. <laughs> laws about what you can grow and what you can't grow. Why? Because God is making a nation. But the heart behind every single one of those laws still exists for us because that law has not been abolished. Romans chapter 3 verses 19 through 20 speak of that. But also, Jesus says it himself in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Take a snapshot, read those <laughs> on your own. Continuing these last couple of, these last few verses. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Why am I saying that? Because God doesn't do away with his covenants. The same promise that God gave to Abraham applies now to those of us who are in Christ because that is the most relevant covenant. The most relevant relationship with God is that of Christ. It's not about old and it's not about new. It's always about being in the most relevant. Being in the most relevant means that there is no such thing as a Jew or a Gentile. Everybody who was in Christ is also an heir of God's promise. No, that doesn't mean that there aren't different people groups. Yes, absolutely there are different people groups. God's not saying when he says that there's no longer male nor female that everybody is now asexual. No, that's not what God is saying at all. He is, however, saying that no longer is there separation based upon this relationship that I once had, that relationship is now expanded in Christ. 
And individuals who find themselves in Christ also find themselves wrapped up in every covenant that I've ever had with humanity and are responsible to every covenant that I've had with humanity. Humans are still supposed to be fruitful and multiply and caring for the earth. Humans are still supposed to be making sure that we are, that we are stewarding well what God has given us. Humans are still supposed to care about what we put in our bodies. We're still supposed to care about how it is that we relate to God and other people. And we're still expected to be a blessing to the world. So, some reflection and action. How am I engaged in the mission of God? I'm taking us way back to that first, that first uh, statement. The mission of God is that creation would know its creator. I mean everything in creation should be able to see us, excuse me, see God in us. I know we focus a lot on human beings seeing God in us, but that was not the expectation from the beginning. It wasn't just humans. Chickens (laughs) should know that there's a God because of how we represent him in the earth. That sounds weird. Like some of you are like, what? I don't get it. (laughs) God placed humanity in authority and in care of all of creation. So trees should know there is a God because of how we represent him in this earth. And absolutely other humans should too. But the mission of God is that creation. And if if there was some other being that could do it, he would have given it to dolphins. But he didn't. He gave it to us. How am I engaged in the mission of God? Because the mission also is a part of that defined relationship in the covenant. If I'm not about seeing the mission of God carried out, then the covenant is broken. Why am I saying that? Because those of us who are about exploiting the earth, the covenant is broken. We have messed up. Our responsibility of being a blessing to the world is jacked up because we have failed to see what the mission of God is that creation would know there is a God. Another reflection in action um, is don't sleep on the Old Testament. <laughs> Some of us have been taught that as Christians, the only thing we really need to focus on is everything from Matthew to Revelation in the Bible. And that is a false statement. It is a fallacy. Um, And I would say at its most innocent is ignorant, as in not understanding the role of the Old Testament. But at at its most devious, um, (laughs) Um, it's, it is manipulative, uh, and, and honestly, there are, have been leaders who have kept us away from seeing the Old Testament because there's things in the Old Testament that actually also give us power to understand how we can be mature in God. If I want to dangle all of my expectations above you and say you have to do what I want you to do, then I won't tell you to read the Old Testament because the Old Testament speaks to what humanity is supposed to look like. From Genesis all the way through Malachi, it tells us what humanity is supposed to look like. And if we don't read the Old Testament, then quite honestly, we stay baby Christians waiting for some leader to feed me something else as opposed to being mature humans, able to respond to the spirit and maturity, understanding the culture of the kingdom of God, which started way back in Eden and exists to this day. And it's important for us to grasp all of what God is saying. Grasp all of it. I think I need to be clear in saying that The expectation of us as believers isn't to live as close to the Old Testament as possible. Though, I think it's also okay for us to say we have enough freedom in Christ where if that's what you want, you can. (laughs) If you don't want to eat crab, then don't eat crab. (laughs) 
You don't want to eat catfish and pork? Then don't eat catfish and pork. If you want to wear uh, fringes on your clothes, wear fringes on your clothes. You never want to shave your beard? Don't shave your beard. <laughs> Why? Because we've been given freedom in Christ. You can do that if you want to. Know that that is, not our, that is no longer what makes us right with the Father. What makes us right with the Father is our relationship to Christ. But if you want to, go for it. As long as there is a relationship to Christ that is clear. Read the Old Testament. Don't sleep on it. And let us be about living out the most relevant covenant that exists for humanity. That is through Christ, who is God in human form, who has come and lived and died and rose for us. The blood bond is his blood. The connection is he provides for humanity and expects us to represent him well on the earth. And that expectation is, is far-reaching, but also that expectation creates an environment for a blessing for the world around us too. I will always keep pointing us to that. We're not saved just so that we don't go to hell. We're not saved just so that we go to heaven. We're saved because we now are the most relevant representation of Christ, a relevant representation of God's presence in the earth. And he has given us the Holy Spirit, which is that privilege now, to be able to enact that representation. So we are ambassadors for God, living as Christ, but also representing the Father well so that creation will know its creator. Old covenant, new covenant, most relevant <laughs> covenant. Don't sleep on the Old Testament, fam. All right, let's pray, <laughs> and then we can, uh, we can wrap up. Father, uh, we thank you that you see us in our frailty. You see us in our imperfection. You see us in all that is the messiness of humanity, and you still covenant with us. You still want to have closeness and relationship with us. We read through the Old Testament, there are a number of times where you even talk about just wanting to be done and just, we're going to start all over. And I thank you, God, that you didn't. <laughs> thank you, God, for your mercy. Even though we were filthy, you still love us, care for us, wrap us in your grace Wrap us in your kindness and your goodness is on full display because we still get to have intimacy with you, Father. And so, Lord, as we strive to live in this most relevant form of relationship that you have with humanity, give us your power, your wisdom. Anoint us afresh, God, that all of creation would know there is a God. All of creation would recognize creator, every knee, every tongue, all things that have breath praising you. Because of how we represent you well here. We trust you in that. We thank you for your provision in doing so. We honor you and glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You. Hey, fam, before we sign off, um, there, so we sent out an email this past week, um, and then also, you know, been talking about it uh, on a, a couple other different spaces as well. This Wednesday, family meeting. As it is right now, we're still planning on doing both in person and uh, on, online. And so check out the email. That plan hasn't changed. I think we have to be aware of the fact that we're in a national uptick again when it comes to um, COVID. Uh, and Grand Rapids has also, like we've, we've moved from, uh, I think it was phase three, or excuse me, phase four to phase three. Lansing is back in phase two um, in terms of uh, the, the statewide um, phasing back into the quote unquote normal. Uh, so because we've moved back in our progression as a state, that means there's a little bit of a question mark for unison as, the terms, as it relates to how we move forward. So just saying that to say we're staying flexible, okay? 
do your stretches, fam. Like, <laughs> do wake up in the morning and stretch emotionally because we may even get to Tuesday and find out, like, hey, we need to do the whole meeting online. Uh, the meeting is going to happen regardless. Um, it just may happen uh, online. So we'll make sure that everybody's in the know about what to expect. We're still going to be social distancing when we get here. Um, as that, as that, uh, what that looks like is when you're in your seats, you don't have to wear a mask, but because the seats are going to be spread out far enough in, in groups and pockets to make sure that everybody's good. But when we're walking around the building and when we can't ensure social distancing is when we'll make sure that we have masks on. And so, um, again, we'll make sure that's clear on Wednesday. Looking forward to seeing some of you here and being able to engage with some of you online. Love you all. I miss you. And I will see y'all later. <laughs> I think we're done. I don't have anything else, right? Good. Love you, fam. Peace.